What is up, Artemers? I hope you are so well. Welcome to my kitchen. The first place I honestly ever learned philosophy, thanks to my wonderful father. Today we are going to be making a fusion of two of my favorite meals, beef and broccoli and jalapeno, you know, spicy pepper chicken. Uh, with chicken. If you would like to follow along, the ingredients we are going to be using include chicken, broccoli, jalapenos, onion, garlic, ginger, cornstarch, soy sauce, oyster sauce, sriracha, salt and pepper, green onion, sesame seeds, and sesame oil. And of course, gloves for the jalapenos because, ouch. Um, so welcome! I'm so excited! Speaking of chicken, if we are just gonna gab here and talk vloggy style, what the F is up with the prices of chicken right now? They are absolutely and utterly disgraceful. I don't know why, other than the fact that maybe there's a chicken uprising of not enjoying their their quality of life. That's that's what my first uh, animated assumption is, at least. But that's just me. If you don't know, I may or may not have written an entire paper on the food industry and how disgusting it is. But I don't even know when that was, or if it's on my blog or anything. But there's too many disgusting documentaries about the topic. The first being, of course, Food Incorporated. It's, it's hard to say where exactly my love of food or my hatred of bad food came from, but that is definitely one of the places. I also wanted to mention here today that I don't know how to say this, but like I was pretty much raised as a Buddhist and fell in love with the story of Siddhartha Gautama at a super young age. And what exactly brought him to enlightenment but food? Literally a girl giving him a bowl of rice under what I would think is called like the Bodhavita tree where he was trying to find where it all meant. Why, why all this suffering? Why all this illness and death and everything is awful and I've been too sheltered to, to know any about any of this. And then he starves himself to death after living with the ascetics for X amount of time and didn't think they were really figuring out the ending of all suffering, so we went to go figure it out. And what, in the end, helps him but the giving of a bowl of rice to where he realized starving is not the answer to ending your suffering. If you ask me, that would just add right to it. There we find the middle way of moderation and moderation is the most key thing in all of cooking i know one could say i could be more moderate in my garlic use let's be honest here this is a lot but you know to a good extent it is it's good for you and if you eat just enough it's fine for a good like beef and broccoli sauce, you honestly want a ridiculous amount of ginger. And I was thinking even in with the sauce mixture, we could add some minced ready ginger. Um, admittedly, I buy both fresh and like jarred uh, gingers and garlics just so you get the most amount of that. <laughs> When it comes to moderation, it's really hard to say with things like ginger and garlic because they are, what's it called, antibacterial foods? 
They help with uh, killing lots of bacteria. <laughs> they say if you're ever questioning your meat or whatever it may be, just uh, give it a, a great amount of ginger and garlic and it'll help kill any of the bacteria going on. Which I thought was crazy. I also made up a list of talking points. Uh, just in case I ran out of things to say. So I can get that in a minute. But one of you guys suggested that I read uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. To which I am halfway through the first part and oh my gosh is that not what I expected in the book. I had literally zero idea what it was about other than existentialism. Goes pretty deep. Goes pretty deep. Um, <laughs> of course starting the book I did read the preface to which when I say I read I religiously use audible. Uh, you know reading is difficult. So <laughs> getting back to what I was saying, I was listening to the preface of The Man's Search for Meaning by Gordon All... Gordon, the guy who wrote it. And it was seriously the most beautiful, deepest stuff I'd ever heard. As a fun little story, there is a quote highly attributed to Frederick Nietzsche, our boy, and apparently he did not write it, but rather the author of the preface of a book by Viktor Frankl. Sometimes it's a attributed to Frankl, but more often Nietzsche. So in reading the book, I was actually pretty much like, whoa, there's the quote, there's the, the line you hear all the time when it comes to Nietzsche, but of course it wasn't him. And so when I was looking up it, when I was looking it up today, I actually found an article that explains the entire ordeal. So I would definitely suggest to give that a read. So Gordon Allport was the author of the preface to Man's Search for Meaning. It's, it's all a mouthful. So Gordon Alport wrote, To live is to suffer, to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. And then he also wrongly attributed a quote from Nietzsche that isn't a quote from Nietzsche at all. He actually just made it up, this Gordon Alport, where he writes, He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. In the context of the book Man's Search for Meaning, the how is very dark. Um, spoiler alert here, it's about the Holocaust and it's written by a survivor and it's so it's an entire account from a Holocaust survivor writing on how he dealt with it in relation to psychology, not philosophy. I am, again, halfway through the first part of the book, and so I would love to talk more about it, but I don't think I can yet. I'm not even to stage three, so to speak. I mean, cutting and talking at the same time is not easy. I don't know how my dad did this for my entire growing up. Mostly like mincing things while talking at the same time. Well, I'm not going to mince this, let's be honest. It's just going to be teeny little cuts. Admittedly, I did go to hospitality school for one year, and so I should know the name to the cut, but I do not remember. So getting back to existentialism, I love the theory of existentialism or the the philosophy of it's pretty much where i fell in love with philosophy in all reality catch me like age 12 just like i didn't read whatsoever until i found the free just public domain books 
which of course started with, you know, Alice in Wonderland and just that one. But then I found things like Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Kant, all of those classic amazing dudes who are so old, their books are in the public domain and free to just read forever. Be that through uh, Kindle or audiobook with LibriVox. I was hooked immediately. Um, it's really funny to think that Nietzsche hated Buddhism, because um, I think they go hand in hand. Both say you affirm life, and what more to life is there but suffering? A realistic way, both philosophies of Nietzscheism and Buddhism, classic Siddhartha Gautama style, you just rewrite what suffering is. You detach from the words you're used to. So, if anyone ever asks, was, was Nietzsche a Buddhist? He would say no, but I would say he almost got there. Almost. I don't think he had the right translations. I do want to shout out that I have not suffered enough to say that I am a true Nietzschean who thinks that suffering makes you better. But that's just like trying to be humble, I guess. If you ask me, I would love to finish uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, as Allport said he quotes Nietzsche all the time, and, you know, some people would say that that's a little ironic, but I think it's just beautiful. Those who think it's ironic just don't understand Nietzsche. But after I read that book, maybe we could do an entire video on it, so you might be curious what I'm doing to my garlics, but mostly if you peel out the inside middle bit that goes green, or it's supposed to eliminate any heartburn that you might get from garlic. I don't really get heartburn from garlic, but I do this, so maybe that's why. But the reason why I do really want to say that I have not suffered to truly state I'm a Nietzschean is because of the context of the man's search for meaning. So again, I am super grateful to who suggested my reading it. I'm pretty sure my dad did years ago, but right now he's trying to get me to reread the metaphysics of morals because he is teaching a ethics communications course. I honestly uh, can't lie. I just finished reading the book 1984 for the third time in my life. I read it once when I was 12, finding it, you know, free public domain, and another time in like junior high when it was or no, not junior high, but junior year of high school when it was required reading. And basically, I have loved it every single time. Now, listening to it through Audible to show it to my boyfriend, Lauren, shout out. I think it was just so fantastic to get all the way to the end again because I block it out of my memory every single time. It's truly heartbreaking. Lauren was just awestruck. He was like, that, that was the most depressing book of I've ever read or listened to, which is so saying something because, I don't know, we read The Sphere and iRobot, all very existential books, but what's different about 1984 is that the main character thinks he's won in the end, and he's so happy to love Big Brother. But what's what's the true is true, and Lauren, I uh, gotta say, he pointed out this first, but that's just wrong. He lost. That's the, the... Him thinking he's won by loving Big Brother. 
is losing. And that book in itself is very existential or maybe more so phenomenological, phenomenology uh, cool <laughs> toward the end there because it really makes you question your existence in that who am I? You know, for any of you guys who haven't watched my memory and morality video, that is uh, an underrated uh, gold star, um, it, I gotta say. But I love the question of emptying the human soul and ripping out everything that makes one oneself. Are you still yourself? That is the biggest question in the entire world. So, if you ask me, 1984 is completely overrated and somehow pop culture has taken the number by storm and plastering it all over the place because they think we live in that that book. But it's it's not entirely false at the same time. I do think the way in which we are almost constantly under the Hawthorne effect of social media and putting ourselves on camera nonstop to plaster ourselves into this weird multi-dimensional non-reality. But then you say, well, if that's where people spend their time, then it isn't it reality? I don't know. I'm a little bit of an anti-technology sort of person, but I do. It's TV. Could not live without my TV. Even got my cute little iPod running with the TV on, because why not? To live is to suffer. To suffer is to find meaning. In, to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. So giving meaning to our suffering is probably one of the hardest things in the entire world for most people. Like I said, I don't know if I've dealt with any like actual suffering other than like being below like the poverty line. But you know, you just give meaning to it. Growing up Buddhist, I think I have a complete and utter bias here in saying the difficult level. I would love to figure out a way in which I could word how you do it. Just like when you meditate, you just, you just do it. Empty your mind and breathe. And some people say that meditation isn't actually emptying your mind. I think that's a hunk of baluey. It's, it is possible to empty your mind. You're just not doing it right. But I would love to know your guys' thoughts on maybe is there levels to suffering itself? You know, is there a lenience here to being able to call surviving from suffering meaningful? I feel like a really bad example would be like the rapper Eminem saying he survived and gave meaning to all this suffering and then other people are all like that's not suffering I don't know what you're, you're thinking bro but it's always on a personal level and so reconfiguring out the language just as in beyond good and evil Nietzsche believes that you have to find a path through nihilism to hit to that beautiful overman. I don't want to use too much jargon here, but to the beautiful overman, ubermensch sweet spot to where you create the laws of your own life. And beautifully enough, he says that all of this is done through art. I wish he'd written more on food, as food is one of my favorite arts, but apparently, as he also lived under the poverty level, um, he, he didn't 
care to write about it. I think one thing that's really fun about philosophy is that you can ponder on a quote for ages. Your whole life, realistically, you could ponder on one meaningful quote. And I think this is one of them, where to live is to suffer and to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. It's almost like a mantra that you could say to yourself through any point of personal crisis. And so through each point in which you find your suffering, you just say, to live is to suffer, which is uh, a Buddhist just truism. Life is suffering. To survive, is to find meaning in the suffering. This is something very much so attributed to Nietzsche. He pretty much devoted his entire life to finding the meaning to all of the suffering in his own life. It's probably why I love him so much. I don't know, I don't think growing up poor in anything in the man's search for meaning is a like whatsoever, unless you're actually not eating um, due to that fact. But luckily, I was never in that situation, and uh, I've always had my father to get my back. Basically, just live off chicken and rice and you'll be good. But that's not a true statement anymore because chicken is really expensive. <laughs> you know, it's really hilarious because a lot of people, um, I don't know if they follow me or anything, will just like randomly comment, this is such ASMR, you have the most beautiful, softest voice, blah blah blah. And now I'm just like over here chopping vegetables and people are gonna say it. 10 times as hard, I swear. So I've got a pre-cut onion here in a handy dandy Talenti container. I don't know if I've said this yet, but uh, recycle all of your plastics and reuse as much as you can. Talenti containers being the number one storage containers. I was not supposed to do this. I'm gonna leave all of these as strips. And just put the, this in my, like, aromas. Let's hope YouTube doesn't yell at me for putting on Food Wars, by the way. If Hulu allows it, then... Fun fact. The first time I brought home these peppers and cut them with no gloves, I was sitting at my desk for days with my hand just in a cup of milk. It was awful. Anyways, back to my story. <laughs> um, so I went to culinary school in my junior year of high school through a tech school, so many words, and I basically started having a lot of issues with my stomach at the same time. Um, so if you don't know, I do not really eat gluten unless I'm a glutton, and lactose is one of my arch nemeses. So I basically kind of like gave up on that dream, as well as found that being told what to do when it comes to like an art is not really my forte. Like, I just want to have fun and make yummy food and they're all like, cut it one centimeter this way and blah 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 and I'm just like, this is stupid. <laughs> this is not my passion for a career. Unless you guys really enjoy me doing this, then this could be my career forever. But totally different. I was actually thinking a lot about my senior thesis, what, like yesterday? And I mean, every day, let's be honest. I was thinking, I keep thinking about people not wanting to be creative because they think everything's already done, been done before. But in reality, people are still 
making art all the time and it just doesn't really feel like art. And this is because they aren't authentic. People aren't making art for themselves and their enjoyment and expunging their suffering and giving it a new meaning. They're making art to make money. They're not being authentic in their choices. They're being driven by society to make money and get that ad sense. Honestly, it's it's horrendous. What's ironic, in my Nietzsche course in uh, university, my professor basically said to ignore the two different arts that Nietzsche talks about, the like Dionysus and the other one. But nowadays I'm like super duper curious about what he was on about that. I usually do my broccoli like all the way last and just like cut it into the pan, but I've got this handy dandy strainer here, so I might as well. Okay, so it's officially taken me way too long to make dinner. Uh, it's 1.30 in the morning, so oh my gosh, if you're here all the way to the very end, you are a freaking super duper person. Um, I was thinking maybe something more casual won't do super well, uh, but at the same time, none of my most recent videos have done super well. I would love to get your guys' opinions, but after literally just explaining my thoughts on authentic art, I do reserve the right to not make every requested video. I, I feel like I'm, I'm making everything pessimistic here. So ignore what I am saying. Don't listen to my words. Just listen to the tones of my voice. So can I get a, a hands up for how many people in the views here enjoy a ridiculous amount of broccoli stock? I used to eat these when I was a kid. You know, dad's making some chicken and broccoli and he's like, hey, here you go, you want to eat this? And I'm just like, yeah, bro. Yeah. Can't lie, my, my childhood was far too complicated to even like talk about in a single video. I feel like most things are out of context. If you're curious, maybe I'll write a whole freaking autobiography one day. I'm actually dying to write a book a philosophy book. I want to take my senior thesis all the way to the printer, uh, but first I have to like make it 20 times longer at least. What's also additionally funny is I wanted to write a cookbook for the longest time as well, and I've been watching a ridiculous amount of David Chang's Ugly Delicious and so I am just super duper inspired by him really not giving a single F about like uh, recipes and giving things specific numbers because that goes against the art of cooking. Just listen to Roger from American Dad, you know, just breathe, listen to your heart. I think I finally cooked from here. Promising. Where are they? Where are what? The measuring cups that you use to make this! You're right! I cheated! To make our sauce, I did forget a couple of ingredients, including um, minced ginger and brown sugar. Brown sugar is pretty important here. Um, it's gotta be sweet. I usually put about two, two spoons. My next step is usually to just fill the soy sauce up to the brown sugar and then I think I would guesstimate about a quarter of a cup. I also like to add in the oyster sauce because it has brown sugar as well as seafoody flavor. To which if you're making Asian food and it doesn't have a hint of seafoody flavor, like, I don't know, to me it's, it's usually pretty boring. Just saying. 
Next is the Sriracha. I would say Sriracha to taste. Um, but me personally, if the spoon is still in the bowl, I like fill it. Fill the spoon. Lastly is the minced ginger, and I'm just going to do like a couple blops. Blop. And then because this is like a sauce based dish, we're actually going to like add water eventually, but I usually wait until like I need it. And then the trick with uh, sesame seed oil is you don't really put it in your dish until way closer to the end so you can actually taste it unless you are marinating with it. For instance, like soaking all of your cabbage in uh, sesame seed oil before frying it up is to die for. Um, but at the same time, you don't throw cabbage in until the very end either, so. All right, so with our sauce made, I think I will um, maybe bid you adieu. Um, I have no idea what this angle looks like on me. Hopefully I'm looking fly uh, looking good so again if you're all the way here to the very end i hope you enjoyed uh cooking and talking if this worked for you i i think i can i can do this again but it, it, it was difficult so <laughs> please let me know your, all of your thoughts in the comments and uh, I hope you enjoyed the food if you try to recreate it. If you do end up recreating this dish, please let me know how it went and if you enjoyed it um, or if I gave terrible instructions. So, you know, it's a watch and learn, not a read and learn kind of thing. So, um, <laughs> anyways, always a super pleasure having you and thank you so so much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and thank you again for taking the time to hang out with me. So I love you. Bye! Yeah.